Hi, good evening. Good evening, Sultan. Hi, Violet. Hello. YouTube is good. Let's go with Facebook now. Nice. Something is not happening with Facebook. It's okay, then I'll just share the link. YouTube is good. Let's go with Facebook now. Something is not happening. It's okay, then I'll just share the link. Ooh, it's okay, then I'll just share the link. Live on YouTube. I mean, make me host for one minute, please. I'm going to try Facebook again. Um, Violin, we are okay. We are ready on. That's fine. We, okay. We are, we are on already. That's okay. Thanks. So fellow Toastmasters and Rotarians, we are just playing some. So fellow Toastmasters and Rotarians, relevant videos on our channels. Some. So fellow Toastmasters and Rotarians, relevant videos on our channels. Some. So fellow Toastmasters. We are getting a simultaneous broadcast there. <laughs> Dominica, the Caribbean nature island today, on the 18th of September, 2020. Its glorious nature surrounds us. Hiking through lush green forests is a joy. Seeing wide mountainous vistas or beautiful and unique shore formations is truly an uplifting experience. It's mm. This land of many waterfalls and rivers has plenty to offer, yeah. despite being just a small volcanic island. Walking today through Roseau, its capital, <laughs> It's hard not to reflect. Exactly three years ago, Dominica suffered terrible devastation inflicted by the monster Hurricane Maria. One of the strongest Atlantic hurricanes ever, it went through our island with the power of several nuclear bombs. Lives were lost, whole communities swept away, wildlife decimated. Looking around today, it's hard to believe that it really happened so recently. And yet, all of us who went through it will never forget that night and the following morning of destruction. Although every person here has his own story to tell, this commemorative video shares what we all remember like yesterday. Let's rewind three years back. trees fell. Some of those still standing in the forest simply died of impact and shock. Green color practically disappeared.
Raging waters caused thousands of landslides. Water pushed huge boulders down from the mountains, creating avalanches of debris. Furious seas washed away homes and roads. Whatever wasn't washed away got buried under huge logs. Broken forest trees pulled to the sea by cascading floodwaters. First days and weeks were mostly about immediate survival. Fixing a piece of roof, cutting a path to your neighbors, finding some food, helping those who really needed it. Recovery started slowly, both in nature and among humans. The damage was so extensive that it all seemed overwhelming and surreal. And yet, step by step, week by week, we all made progress. Trees turn green again. Just see the forest grow. Wildlife slowly came back. Bird songs were more frequently heard. Roads and bridges were rebuilt. Water, electricity, and communications restored. Now, after three years, it may seem like a bad dream, but the scars are still visible. They remind us of the starting point and how far we have progressed. Let's have a quick look again and compare. While we'll never forget it, and with the climate change, there is a chance it may happen again sooner than we wish. This rapid recovery of nature and the ability of this small island nation to stand strong so quickly borders on the miraculous. We should cherish, enjoy, and respect our beautiful island nation. And we should remember that our determination gives us strength. So we should never be afraid to look to the future with hope.
So what we looked at was the scene from this island, beautiful island that I'm sitting at right now in the Caribbean. Some of us live online are from the nature isle of Dominica. And we're getting ready to discuss the impact of climate change around the world. But it doesn't only surface in terms of um, hurricanes and disasters. There are other impacts that we all know we need to be aware about. And the next short promotional documentary that we're going to look at, which I mean, I think is getting set for us, speaks exactly to that. If we stay on our course, we could look at a worldwide catastrophe. Industrial agriculture is first and foremost a war against the earth because it is a war against all species since you're bringing war chemicals into food production and all they're doing is killing. We cannot fight nature. You cannot poison things to the extent that where you, quote, win. It's a challenge to live in a world where our government cannot be counted on to defend us from an industrial food system that's actually making us sick. Hopefully soon, the planet will change. People should really learn about how to help your community and help yourself in life. You can grow 100% organic, nutrient-dense food at warp speed, basically. This stuff will grow anything. There is a secret here that we've got to unlock. What we've tried to do here is accelerate the regeneration of soil. Well, I've done some testing behind your back. Okay, so you're doing in four to five days what nature would take in about 400 years. 400 years. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> Disrupting food, fuel, and fertilizer all in one little powerhouse. You're going to have a lot of pushback. I worry about it getting squashed before it gets out. Yeah. You don't get points for doing the right thing, and that's the right thing. You just have to do it. We're trying to change Girl Scout cookies so they're healthier. Right now, we have at least 45,000 signatures. Last minute, they decided that the representative was going to be in a meeting. They hung up on me. You never know what could be happening there. They're just called free share. They're just not listening. We just heard a rumor that, that we might lose our farm. 4.30 a.m., telephone rings. I knew it could not be good news. Looking at the amount of heat that needed to be generated, I'm, I'm a little suspicious. To say that we care about the future of this planet, to say that we care about the survival of our species, and to not take action is simply no longer an option. Hopefully, we'll recover from this. This will be the end of one disease. This was our pre-show trailers and it takes us right at the point like good Toastmasters where I hand over to the function Toastmaster for the evening, our most distinguished representative on the Toastmasters and here with us this evening, Mrs. Elizabeth Gordon. Thank you, Dr. Cuffey. Good evening and welcome distinguished guests, Rotarians, Toastmasters and friends. Welcome to the fourth event in this series of Making Connections. I'm Elizabeth Jordan, and as Dr. Cuffey said, I'm your Toastmaster for the evening. My role is to make sure everything flows smoothly and we finished promptly as 
promised. I've been pr privileged to attend all four events and they're getting bigger and better. So we know that we're in for an absolutely amazing evening. We've got four very, very distinguished panelists. What I will do, I will introduce Dr. Cuffey in a minute, and then I will introduce each panelist before they speak. So the four panelists, each panelist has five minutes and there's a timer who will indicate the time to you. So as soon as you're finished, I will then introduce the next panelist. So with that in mind, let's make a start um, and I'll introduce Dr. Cuffey. Dr. Cuffey has the unique, held this unique position of being both a Rotarian and a Toastmaster. So she can wear two hats and give us um, two points of views. She was a Rotaractor and she's currently a Rotarian at the Luton Summaries Rotary Club. We know her, of course, as a distinguished Toastmaster. And last year, she had the distinction of leading a President's Distinguished Club and their President's Distinguished Area. And that's quite an honor. And I think partly because of that, this year, the district director has invited her to be the chair of the Rotary Toastmasters Alliance. So we're lucky to have such a distinguished person who also started her new club, um, Orators Online, and whose this event is the brain is her brainchild. So we're in very distinguished company. So this that's your um, host for the evening. And now let me introduce speaker number one, who is um, Jean Billings. And Jean is a chartered engineer and environmentalist. So absolutely the right person for the right topic tonight, because of course our theme is focus on the environment. She's got many years experience in senior management in the engineering world, has done project management, worked on multi-million pound projects at Rolls-Royce in Alstom. But tonight we are sitting with bated breath to hear her talk to us about focus on the environment. So please put our hands together for our very first panelist, Jean Billingsley. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, perhaps I could just start by um, echoing that warm welcome on behalf of Rotary District 1260 and Rotary Great Britain and Ireland. Um, it is fantastic to see this collaboration between Toastmasters and Rotary, both great international organisations. Um, my personal international experience with Rotary was that I led a, um, a group study exchange to the Caribbean a few years ago and I got such a warm welcome from the Rotary clubs in the Caribbean and Rotary is like that, it's one big happy international family. Um, so today's theme is the environment, so so important in today's world and you know a topic obviously close to, to my heart as well. Um, so before we start on the, the, the main panel, um, we'd like to just share with you just a very few uh, short words from Barry Rassin, who's the um, former president of Rotary International. Thank you. This will be the end of one disease, but a new chapter in Rotary. A chapter where sustainability is front and center. Sustainability has become the watchword of Rotary because we want the good to last. We want our world to be better, not just here, not just for us, for everyone for generations. If we really mean that, if we really care about what the world looks like in 10, 20, 50, 100 years, then we have to take the difficulties in our world and the realities in our world seriously. Pollution, environmental degradation, and climate change have had serious impact on our six areas of focus. 
Environmental pollution has been responsible for 1.7 million child deaths every year. Four billion people have water scarcity at least one month out of every year. And that'll just get worse as the weather, as the world gets warmer. I live in a country where 80% of our land is within one meter of sea level. It's projected that by the year 2100, the sea level will rise by two meters. That means my country will be gone in 50 years. That means countries in the Caribbean and coastal areas around the world will be gone in 50 years. So I'm asking you to be the inspiration to move Rotary from reaction to action, to take a hard look at the environmental issues that affect our health and our welfare, to do what we can to make a difference. Sustainable service means looking at everything as part of a larger system, as part of a larger global ecology. It means helping to build stronger and more resilient communities. It means doing everything that we can to make sure that the good we do now is leading to better lives tomorrow and beyond. So I'm asking you to be the inspiration in your clubs, in your districts, to show them what we can do what we can be, to be the inspiration to your countries, to your communities, by coming together, taking action to create lasting change. I'm asking you to be the inspiration because together we can, we will inspire the world. And I thank you for everything you're going to do to make our world a better place next year. Thank you. I think that takes us to segment number two, Elizabeth. Um, thank you. I, I, I okay. Thought um, um, Jean was going to say a few more words, but thank you. Okay, our second panelist is Dr. Cleopatra Duambia Henry, who is an academic and is the president of Maritime University. Dr. Cleopatra is an international lawyer, a global leader on maritime law and labor law and labor standards. And I could go on and on, but she has got a very distinguished CV. We are all absolutely um, waiting with bated breath to hear what she has to say to us. So can I invite Dr. Cleopatra, please, to the, to the stage? Thank you. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right, very good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, all protocols observed, probably that may be the best way to start so that I don't have to uh, call everyone's names. Um, but uh, the theme that I have selected is a certainly a timely one, the theme that you have selected is certainly very timely. As environmental issues, and I uh, just heard your um, um, Secretary General uh, has indicated, as he has indicated, the environmental issues appear to take, unfortunately today, a backstage with the energy and efforts that the world is currently dedicating to addressing, which it must do, COVID-19. This focus is certainly necessary in the absence of a vaccine with the need to reduce 
the reach and the breadth of the pandemic and with many countries, as we know, already experiencing the second wave. But this pandemic has certainly caused unimaginable devastation and hardship around the world. No corner, no, not one single corner of the world has been spared. It has brought our lives to almost a halt and has exposed the gains that have been made in addressing poverty, hunger, good health, and well being. One of the most important gains that has been pursued in recent times relate to the environment, and in particular, issues related to greenhouse gas emissions. Unless the global community continues to urgently address the global environmental challenges that we now face and the threats that come with it, the systems that enable humanity and the planet to survive and thrive will be gravely undermined. While COVID-19 continues to have the negative and direct, both direct and indirect effects on people's lives everywhere, there has also been some very positive impact with respect to the environment. There's a significant association between contingency measures being undertaken and the improvement of air quality, clean beaches and environmental noise reduction. At the same time, however, we have been witnessing a reduction in recycling and an increase in waste, further endangering the contamination of physical spaces, water and land in addition to the air. Among the major challenges relating to the environment is the issue of chemical and hazardous waste management, which has significantly increased necessitating the medical response to COVID-19. We should not, however, sacrifice, and I want to stress that, we should not sacrifice the global environmental governance as the health of people and the planet are interconnected. Today, more than ever before, we need land to ocean leadership in order to address some of the major challenges that we are facing. And one of those challenges that I would like to highlight, because it's a real scourge today, is marine litter. The scourge of marine litter on the environment, and more specifically, marine plastic litter. The subject, the subject, falls on the goal 14, oceans of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Marine litter, particularly marine plastic litter, enters the marine environment as a result of a wide range of land and sea-based activities. Both macroplastics, for example, large plastic items such as plastic bags, water bottles, and fishing gear, and microplastics, which are small plastic particles, generally five millimeters or less in size. These persist in the marine environment and result in very harmful effects on marine life and on biodiversity, as well as negative impacts on human health. Marine, marine plastic litter, in addition, negatively impacts on activities such as tourism, fisheries, and shipping. This plastic material has the potential to be brought back into the economy by means of the use and reuse, as well as recycling. A number of studies have demonstrated that despite the existing regulatory framework that are currently in place to prevent marine plastic litter from ships, discharges into the sea continue to occur. 
This is a big important issue at the IMO, the International Maritime Organization headquartered in London, the mother institution of the World Maritime University that I lead. The action plan that has been adopted is one that will address marine litter, particularly marine litter from ships, focused on plastic litter from ships, including information on the contribution of all ships to marine plastic litter, information relating to the storage, delivery, and reception of plastic waste, and an analysis of the existing body of knowledge on plastic litter from all sea-based sources, as well as an assessment of data gaps, development of regulatory frameworks to identify all international regulatory instruments and best practices associated with the issue of marine plastic litter from ships. An action plan for a mechanism to identify specific outcomes and actions in order to achieve these outcomes in a way that is meaningful and measurable is in urgent need. The plan will build on existing policy and regulatory frameworks and identify opportunities in order to enhance these frameworks and introduce new supporting measures to address the issue of marine plastic litter from ships. A number of processes are already ongoing and some of the measures to be taken include a study on marine plastic litter from ships, the availability and the adequacy of port reception facilities, very much needed if we have to address the issue. Cooperation among the various United Nations organizations, the FAO and the, ILO, and the IMO, as well as the ILO, making and the marking of fishing gear and making it mandatory, better training for fishing vessel personnel, as well as importantly, enhancing public awareness. The good news is that a number of the UN agencies have come together to address this issue. IMO, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the United Nations Environmental Program. This is an important turning point in effectively addressing this huge problem. In fact, I have launched a major project for capacity building in the Caribbean, dealing with marine debris and sagassum, as well as marine spatial planning. We're working with the regional organizations in CARICOM, OECS, the University of the West Indies, and, then, and I have recruited recently six PhD students from the Caribbean to work on this important project here at the World Maritime University. Considering the challenging times in which we now live, we must remain positive. We must be forward looking. As governments approve stimulus packages to support job creation, poverty reduction, development and economic growth, we together have to join the bandwagon to build back better. We must capture opportunities to leapfrog to green investments, such as creating green jobs, a transition to renewable energy, and a carbon new neutral future. Smart housing, green public procurement, and of course, public transport. These must be guided by the principles and the standards of sustainable production and consumption and will be key to a resilient and sustainable future in accordance with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In conclusion, we should all have the expectation that the global economic activity would hopefully return sooner rather than later and in the coming months in most countries, even if this was slow, now, however, is the time. It's the time not to dwell on what we could have done, 
but rather on what we can do, what we can do no matter how small, to hope and to care and to do that, all of us together with immediate effect. Generation Z, which is the 15 to the 21 year olds, they depend on us and we must not let them down. Thank you. Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Let's show a round of applause for Dr. Cleopatra. Thank you. We continue with our panelists and our next pa panelist is Mr. Nathaniel Isaac, who is head of the meteorological department of St. Martin. His career began as a weather observer and in 2000, he was appointed senior meteorological officer at the Dominica Meteorolo Meteorological Service and where he stayed until 2008 when he was promoted to the national disaster coordinator to national disaster coordinator's role and also served importantly as the permanent representative for dominica with the world meteorological organization for over 10 years um, he's played a leading role in transitioning of mds to a full forecast office in 2013 I think with such an esteemed background, we know we've got a great five minutes in which to hear you present to us. So over to you, please, um, Nathaniel. Thank you very much. Uh, it is my pleasure to be part of this round table discussion. I hope you can see my slide. No, not yet. Are you sharing your screen? Yes, I have a shared screen. Uh, e yes, something's happening. Yes, we're good to go. Okay, I just wanted to quickly, um, for the persons who may not know, just indicate um, where I am speaking from. It's a small island in the Caribbean, uh, St. Martin. It's the smallest island that is shared by two different nationalities. We have the French to the north and the Dutch to the south. Uh, it's uh, 37 square miles, multilingual, multinational, and as I indicated, two different laws, Dutch and French. Um, that, that would put everything into context in terms of the environment, but my presentation will deal more in terms of the impacts of meteorology uh, slash COVID. We, we in St. Martin, we part of the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, we share membership with Curacao, so on the World Meteorological Organization, we group Curacao and St. Martin. We contribute to the global observing system of the World Meteorological Organization, which with 193 members. And this global observing system provides observations on the state of the atmosphere and ocean surfaces from land, marine, and space-based instruments. The data is used for preparing of weather analysis, forecasts, advisories, and warnings. And as we know with the advent of the um, COVID virus, it has changed a lot of things and it has uh, in fact affected countries like St. Martin. And we know the, the different protocols that had to be put in place. So that has indeed affected the uh, service of the international air navigation, quality of weather observations, forecast and climate monitoring. And as we heard from Dr. Cleopatra, data is very important in terms of monitoring what is happening in the environment. So all these protocols and so on, the curfews and so on have definitely affected the collection of data that could be used to verify um, climate and the environment. 
Uh, locally, what we have done is to mitigate against those impacts, the Meteorological Department of St. Martin. Uh, we have locally taken measures and what we have done is the meteorologist, as a person who provide the aeronautical forecast, marine forecast, and the general forecast to the public. With the aid of technology and available technology, everything basically is available online. So those persons are able now to work from the home environment. However, the, the same is not so for the uh, meteorological observers, because the meteorological observers can be identified as the pilot eyes on the ground. Um, basically, one of the important assignments they have is to provide through the air traffic control tower, the weather conditions on takeoff and landing. So as a result, they must be at the airport. However, because we can have some staff which are the meteorologists at home, then we fall right into the scheme of things in terms of having social distancing and having minimum number of persons at the office at any one time. One of the, the, the significant impacts monitored by the World Meteorological Organization in terms of what we've been looking at in terms of data collection and so on, is sig the significant lack of data as a result of the pandemic we're dealing with presently. And we have noticed that about 80% reduction in the number of aircraft observations. And aircraft observations are very critical in terms of um, numerical weather predictions, um, climate predictions, etc. And with that reduction in 80% of observations from aircraft because of the restricted movement of, of flights, um, this can have some sort of impact on the quality of forecasts and climate predictions. The, the, the present capacity and needs, uh, we also have to look at the, the impacts in terms of um, general data collection from manned stations. In most developed countries, most of the stations would be automated. So the, the human impact is not that great. But then we have in developing countries where you have op automation, observations are more, mostly manual. And um, then with the whole advent of the COVID virus, then you, you're still not getting sufficient um, data into the systems. Um, and while there, there, there are many automated and manned stations, then because of the COVID impact, then we have had significant reductions in the number of observations that we receive globally. But looking ahead, um, how, how do we look at, at the environment and how do we look at the impacts? Um, can we just sit back and say, okay, we don't have this, um, or, or how do we manipulate things and so on? And how do we get a, a marry of both sides? Because the challenges that COVID will um, bring to us is that you may have situations, for example, in our situation where we have observers at work, what happens if a few of those observers fall ill and can no longer go actually go to their station to work where they need to be um, to work. So that again is a challenge. The, the multiplying effect of, of that is there might have to be reduction in the number of hours that the airport can function. And again, it also um, tails into the type of flights you may have to have. Most of the flights may have to be sort of humanitarian flights instead of scheduled commercial flights because of insurance and other things. So look, looking ahead, it is, it is very, very important to, to note that at, at the launch of the United Science 2020, the, the, the statement from the um, Secretary General, um, where he spoke about unprecedented uh, conditions and the disruptions of life um, worldwide and also the heating of our planet. And, and, and these are, are significant in that it, we, have to, we have to basically tie in everything. It, it cannot be just, we just concentrate on COVID alone and not look at the environment and not look at the measures we're using to monitor the environment. Because as we are aware, as we speak now, there are a number of um, hurricanes, tropical storms, et cetera, in the Atlantic, you have um, fires in the US and so on and all over the world. So these, these things, we have to really get away to marry them together. 
um, in, in, the, in, the, in the paper, the United Science Report of 2020, which also had a collaboration from the World Meteorological Organization, the United Nations and the International Panel on Climate Change, it also noted significantly that 2016 to 2020 is said to be the warmest five year period on record. Um, the ocean is warmer and more acidic. Our sea level rise is accelerating due to polar ice melt and food and drought produce the highest impacts. So going forward, we need to really take all those things into consideration in terms of the impact of the environment and not just only the impact of the environment, but how we use to measure the impact on the environment, how COVID-19 pandemic can affect um, these measurements. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm sure you'll be, there'll be lots and lots of questions later on. Okay, can we show our appreciation, please? If you stop sharing your slides, you can see us appreciating you with um, a round of applause. Can we give um, Nathaniel a round of applause? Thank you. Let me put my on gallery view. Yeah, I can now see you. Next speaker is Steve Halton or Halton, I hope I've got that correct, Halton, who is from not very far from where I am, actually. You're, Steve is a senior countryside officer and ecologist of Central Bedfordshire Council. He's got over 30 years experience of wildlife and environmental conservation with various conservation organisations across the UK. Fascinatingly and very interesting. You're also a wildlife artist and a writer on natural history and conservation. I hope we're going to see some of that art tonight. <laughs> Teaches art and creative writing. I cannot wait, as I'm sure we all cannot wait, to hear what you've got to say to us. So welcome and we look forward to hearing from you. Over to you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me this evening. Um, I found it really fascinating up to date so far. Some great um, conversations, which are really good. I, I look forward to some more um, as, the, as we get it developed this evening. OK, well, um, I'm sure we all know that we stand at a crossroads, really, at the moment in terms of the environment. Um, some might say an abyss, and I hope it's not an abyss. I hope we are at a crossroads. It's, it's quite ironic, really, I think, that um, on the sort of national stage, that COVID, as one of my colleagues said earlier, COVID has really taken centre stage. Um, and of course, COVID really came about because of the way we treat the environment and global warming. And there's suggestions that there may well be many more um, similar viruses over the next many years as we can continue to treat the planet in the way we do. So we really, really do need to change. And um, this is something that I've been passionate about since I was five years old. And um, I hope it seems to be spreading. And I do hope that people around the world really do now start working together, both as communities and individuals um, in making a real change with, with the way we, we, you know, we interact with this planet. And of course, we really need governments and leaders to take that lead too. Um, to, to make that change. But where I'm coming from is a very local level. Um, I work in local government. So I work in a very small county called Bedfordshire in the UK. Um, and I work in a very small team of people. And we look after um, countryside sites around central Bedfordshire. We've got about 70 countryside sites and they vary from very large um, outdoor spaces where lots of people come to fly kites and to kick a football around and to take photographs and to visit, have a cup of tea and a piece of cake. Some of the sites are very small and they're very important for biodiversity and wildlife. So they, they may be, you know, the size of an average field, but they're very rich and diverse. And we need to, it's a balancing act between inviting people to come and visit our sites, but not um, causing disturbance or interactions that are negative 
to the wildlife. Now, in the UK, over the period, over the last few months, of course, we've had lockdown, like many countries around the world, and our wildlife um, flourished during that period when human beings were restricted to their to their homes or just a short walk around their local area. And that was quite noticeable. Um, I work very much on the front line. So I work with the public and with community groups in raising their awareness of wildlife and biodiversity and how important it is. And that was one positive from, from the COVID outbreak that we had here was that people were able to get out and enjoy their green spaces, their countryside and their local environment. And um, of course, we all know the, 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 um, the research that has been done over many recent years, which, which basically says that green spaces, the environment is good for us. And I think we all know that now. It's very, very good for us. It's good for our mental health and it's good for our physical health to be outside. Um, there's something being, being talked about a lot in the UK now called nature deficiency syndrome, um, whereby children are becoming deficient in their engagement with nature. Because when I was at school, you know, we had nature tables, we had lessons about biology and nature, and it was taught as a subject. And now of course it isn't. Um, and a lot of it is about passing exams and tests and reaching certain standards. So unfortunately, the appreciation and understanding and enjoyment that nature brings um, doesn't happen from that young age so much. We're hoping to see it start to return because it is crucial, I think, to get young people engaged at this at a very young age. Um, and in fact, many cases, the people I work with, often it's the young people who are more um, engaged, if you like, and more interactive with, with nature and organizations like Extinction Rebellion, who are a, um, a protest, a peaceful protest organization in the UK and around the world, um, are primarily composed of young people, um, which is really great to see. So that was one, one positive of COVID, which was seeing people getting out and enjoying their green spaces. It, all, it also showed that actually our green spaces are needed and we don't have enough of them. We tend to build over here in the UK, very dense housing, um, very small gardens, if any at all, and a very small provision of green space locally. Even, that, even if that may be just a park with a few swings and slides and some trees and some bushes. And it's very sad that, you know, that, this, um, that we aren't building in at the very beginning of, of the building process we aren't building in green spaces more into our new developments. The older developments are okay because they often have, um, and I, I live in a village which is surrounded by countryside. So we have really nice green spaces to go, but not everyone's as lucky as me, you know, and they might live in a large town or city with very little access to, to nature and green spaces. And so they become deficit, you know, and they, they don't understand nature and don't get to appreciate it. And I, I always feel, if you don't love something and understand it, then you'll never love it and you'll never understand it. And, and that, that's how we get in this gap between, between, you know, between nature and um, people who don't interact with it. Um, a, a negative of the COVID impact on our countryside areas was that, of course, that sites became extremely busy. And some of you may have seen pictures and photographs of rubbish, people in thousands flocking to beaches and the seaside, um, treating the countryside in a really appalling way by leaving mountains of rubbish um, that, that had to be cleared up, of course, by, by organizations that don't always have the money to clear it up. Um, and that was very unfortunate and very sad, really, to see that you know, people were going to these lovely beauty spots to enjoy them and then leaving all their rubbish behind. And it caused a, a lot of, um, bad feeling by, from the local people who, who had to suffer this, um, this awful sort of exploitation of, of the countryside. Um, and very small sites came under immense pressure from, from people who seemed to show really no respect for the beautiful places that they were visiting, which is very unfortunate. Um, since, since we've come out of lockdown in the UK, um, things have 
in, in a way I've become better because people are now back to work and jobs and shopping and all the things they do. So they aren't visiting our countryside sites quite so much. Um, but the, those who do come, I'm not saying everyone, but we, we have a problem with litter still being left, but now we're getting face masks, you know, face coverings um, being dropped, which of course are a hazard because they're, they're, they're in the environment and they need to be properly collected and disposed of. So, you know, it's like many things, it's a sort of a, a double-edged sword um, as we do have ongoing problems. And it, it has shown really that we need more green spaces um, in our environment and they need to be linked up because so it's no good creating a park surrounded by houses. We need, we need a string of parks that are connected. So biodiversity and wildlife can move from one to the other. Um, and hopefully, even better, it needs to link to the open surrounding countryside. So, you know, all our green spaces are linked across together, so they join up. And we don't just need acres of mown grass, but we need wildland meadows, you know, we need hedges and trees and woodlands and scrub and all these all these areas that are disappearing from, from the UK countryside. Um, so th that, that's been my experience at a very small scale working for local government um, in conservation and the environment. And it's interesting to see how it's sort of, it's, been, it's, it's oscillated really between quite euphoric highs, where it's been fantastic to see people engaging with the environment to some sort of fairly despairing lows with litter and rubbish being left. Um, and a challenge for me in the future is how are we going to manage that? How can we, how can we actually engage with the government to, to make them realize that how important these green spaces are really for, for everyone of all ages and all abilities and all backgrounds. And that, that's my, my kind of um, challenge really for the future is to try and ensure that there's green spaces for everyone to enjoy. I'm, I'm afraid I haven't got any pictures to show you, um, but I can always put them up at another, at another time. But um, that, that's my roughly five minutes of um, discussion, if that's okay. I hope you found that interesting. Um, thank you so much. I found it definitely interesting and I it resonates with me a lot about the green spaces because I try to walk every day in the green space and it makes mm. such a difference to mm. one's well-being and mental and so on. So um, definitely I will I agree with that. Yeah. So let's show our appreciation again for um, Stephen's presentation. And we're back to our fourth panelist, who is Jean Billingsley. And this time, <laughs> Jean is going to talk, to, who is the environmental lead for Road to Win Great Britain Ireland, is going to talk to us on that topic. And we are very excited, Jean. Over to you. Hey, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, yes, so Rotary and the environment, just a quick overview of the, um, the, the Rotary involvement. Um, as you know, Rotary is um, an international organisation and there's 1.2 million members but you know projects happen at the club level and at the district level where a number of clubs work together historically uh rolls royce rolls royce beg your pardon <laughs> rotary has come um has been very much a humanitarian organization um working on humanitarian service and they've had historically um six areas of focus so for example promoting peace and fighting disease have been a lot of the areas of focus. We were delighted that in uh, the summer this year, a seventh area of focus was announced, supporting the environment. So this is in a transitional year, it will be eligible for grants, et cetera, from the next Rotary year next summer. But it was really great to see at the top level that Rotary is recognising supporting the environment is such a key area of focus, which is central to all of their work. Um, we've had some senior people in the past supporting um, environmental issues. Ian Risley, who was um, a past president of Rotary International, um, he had a, a project for the year where he encouraged Rotarians, every Rotarian to plant a tree, so that would be 1.2 million trees. Of course, Rotary being Rotary far exceeded that. We did try to count them, but I think we lost count at about 4 million, but there were certainly many more than 1 million, uh, uh, 1.2 million trees. 
So Rotary is involved in a lot of um, environmental projects, obviously climate change and things like the tree planting are to help mitigate climate change, but also there's issues with biodiversity, uh, such as bee hotels and uh, pollution, such as cleaning up plastic. So internationally, Rotary does a lot of um, um, environmental projects. So here in the UK, we have Rotary, Great Britain and Ireland. So this is essentially a geographical organisation and it is a support group. So we have a support centre and support teams that will help the clubs and districts in doing their projects. So we have a humanitarian service team with a number of different specialist areas of which the environment is one of those. We do use the abbreviation ES for environmental sustainability, and that's our understanding of the definition of environmental sustainability. So under the GBI, Rotary Great Britain and Ireland um, group, we do have um, an ES group. Um, this has been formed over 20 years ago when the then Prime Minister uh, asked um, Rotary, what are you doing about the environment? and it led to the start of this environmental sustainability group. Just an example of some of the projects that we've been doing there. So doing projects and also promoting um, uh, competitions and awards um, you know, to inspire action and encourage action. One item we're doing this year is trying to promote all clubs and encourage them to adopt a sustainability policy. So that, you know, the key of that is that we build and integrate environmental sustainability into everything we do as individual clubs. So Rotary Great Britain Island is a geographical organisation. Within the Rotary world, we also have SRAG, which is one of the 21 Rotary action groups. So these are international um, groups. So for example, there's a, a peace Rotary action group. So this is a worldwide organisation of people in the Rotary family that are supporting the environment. Again, this is one of the newer action groups. It's only been established five or six years. And only this year, have we had a regional chapter starting in Great Britain and Ireland. And um, what they've changed in the rules of Rotary recently is that anyone can now join a Rotary action group. You don't have to be a member of a Rotary club or Rotary family. So anybody can join a Rotary action group if they're concerned in that particular area. And again, they've had many examples, just to highlight um, one or two, they've partnered with the UNEP to produce a handbook for clubs, and that's available for free to download on their website. And we had an SRAG member who was nominated by Rotary International to be observer at COP24, and uh, lots of different projects that um, Rotary has been undertaking across the world. So thank you, that's my very brief introduction and um, it's been inspiring to hear the other speakers here as well. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, that was brief, but extremely powerful. Let's show our appreciation with a round of applause. Thank you. So we now come to that time of the evening when um, Dr. Cuffey will take her role as host and she will facilitate the panel discussion. So over to you, Dr. Cuffey. Fantastic. What a lovely and informative session we've had tonight. Just as I thought it would go with such esteemed persons in the room. And there's so much that came from the discussion. I don't know really where to begin, but I will start with the issue of, because I think it's something very practical that we can really relate to, particularly in the Caribbean, in the small islands, we started with the video of hurricane disasters. And my heart skipped a bit when I heard that there's 80% deductions in record and data collection. So this one is for you, Mr. Isaac. How frightened should we be about the statistics and our dependent on that sort of data for preparedness, disaster preparedness. Can you please enlighten us a little bit on what's the impact, the day-to-day -day impact for citizens, 
particularly in small developing countries? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for the question to allow me to expound a bit. Um, it is of concern, and that, that is the importance of having sort of um, redundancies. Um, the data being collected by aircraft, um, a lot of persons don't know that, that you, you sit on a commercial flight and you go from one place to the other. And a lot of persons- If you can come up a little closer because I'm not hearing so loudly. Okay, uh, maybe just speak a little louder. Is that better now? Yep. Yes, I was saying that a lot of persons who sit on aircrafts move from the Caribbean to Europe, etc. And they're not aware that the aircraft they own would actually be collecting data and feeding it back into some mechanisms that goes into a computer. And then from there, you produ um, produce um, models for weather and so on. So it's a significant amount of data. I mean, apart from just the, the, the models, we're talking about climate models also. Um, what our, our environment is really doing, is it getting hotter and so on. Um, so it is of concern, but there has been an improvement as we have more flights now than when that break actually took place. Um, but it is a, a lot of concern for um, the department in terms of the World Meteorological Organization and not getting that critical type of data. And um, I just wanted to highlight it because a lot of times we, there are a lot of things we take for granted that is happening in the environment and we're not aware of it. Um, so that, that's one of the things that we, we would have to look at. And if, if we know exactly, a lot of persons know, everybody goes on the internet and see what track a, a hurricane is taking and so forth. But that's the sort type of data that they need to put into the models to get the output. And the more data, quality data you have is better your model. So if you don't have quality and a lot of data, if, you, if your data is very sparse, then your models will not be as accurate. And as we already know, um, the meteorological science is already not an accurate science. Okay, I've just seen a message from Mohammed. Would you have time to give a brief contribution, Dr. Mohammed? From we have a doctor, another doctor in the house from the University of Bedfordshire. So I'll just, in response to his message that he has to leave because of some emergency, that I'll open the floor to you to make a contribution before you depart, Mohammed. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, good evening. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a, a great pleasure to be uh, with you all. Dr. Kofi, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, very, very enlightening and informative um, um, discussion so far. I'm very, very happy. Um, my contribution is really um, limited um, to um, add um, environment has been identified as a um, one of the new focus um, area for the uh, Rotor International supporting the environment. Um, but I really would like to talk only about one aspect of this, and that is the climate change and our um, uh, young environmentalist competition that we are running. Um, um, and it's a, it's a new competition organized and promoted by Rotor International in Great Britain and um, Ireland. It is one of the um, of its uh, 11 competitions for young people organized by Rotter International in Britain and um, Ireland. Uh, there are three stages uh, to the competition, each designed to support and encourage the development of environmental skills. Some stages may have been more than uh, one round. Um, so it ranges really between the age of seven to 17 years old. Um, the aims pretty much about interacting uh, to help young people to understand um, the very, very essence of interacting with the environment, to address serious environmental issues, develop and explore solutions to the issues, explore, investigate, research, and undertake an envir environmentally sustainable uh, project. And I actually was um, thinking, given that this competition, ladies and gentlemen, is offered to young um, people, I would like to talk and um, address um, the importance of climate change that has a direct threat um, to um, this category 
um, of um, um, of people, young people. Um, it actually hinders child's ability to survive, grow, and thrive. Children are the least responsible for climate change, yet they will bear the greatest burden of its impact. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, environment, there are so many signs of global warming um, everywhere, and they are more complex than just climbing temperatures. Um, I'd like to play this video. Um, just sharing this video with, with you. I hope that works. Um, there are so many great videos that were shared um, earlier on um, by the distinguished uh, speakers. But I'm just going to try to see. Human activities from pollution to overpopulation are driving up the Earth's temperature and fundamentally changing the world around us. The main cause is a phenomenon known as the greenhouse effect. Gases in the atmosphere, such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons let the sun's light in, but keep some of the heat from escaping, like the glass walls of a greenhouse. The more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the more heat gets trapped, strengthening the greenhouse effect and increasing the Earth's temperature. Human activities, like the burning of fossil fuels, have increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by more than a third since the Industrial Revolution. The rapid increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has warmed the planet at an alarming rate. While Earth's climate has fluctuated in the past, atmospheric carbon dioxide hasn't reached today's levels in hundreds of thousands of years. Climate change has consequences for our oceans, our weather, our food sources, and our health. Ice sheets, such as Greenland and Antarctica, are melting. The extra water that was once held in glaciers causes sea levels to rise and spills out of the oceans, flooding coastal regions. Warmer temperatures also make weather more extreme. This means not only more intense major storms, floods, and heavy snowfall, but also longer and more frequent droughts. These changes in weather pose challenges. Growing crops becomes more difficult. The areas where plants and animals can live shift and water supplies are diminished. In addition to creating new agricultural challenges, climate change can directly affect people's physical health. In urban areas, the warmer atmosphere creates an environment that traps and increases the amount of smog. This is because smog contains ozone particles, which increase rapidly at higher temperatures. Exposure to higher levels of smog can cause health problems such as asthma, heart disease, and lung cancer. So um, with this um, very short, but I think um, informative um, documentary, um, I would like to conclude by saying that Rotarians understand that the whole world is their backyard. They can see the effects of climate change in communities, that the world is, um, um, and, and they actually care about. They haven't waited to take action. They are tackling the problem the way they always do, coming up with projects, using their connections to change policy, and planning for the future. In our district, ladies and gentlemen, D126, uh, D1260, we will be observing the World Environment Day on Saturday, the 5th of June, 2021. And I'd like to conclude by quoting Sir James Beaven. And I quote, we have a single mission to protect and hand on the planet to the next generation Climate change is the biggest threat we face. If we, can, if we don't tackle it, the consequences are grim. We can tackle it and we are. The three most important things we can do are to stop the activities that cause it, 
enhance our resilience to its effects and talk about it. Ladies and, de ladies and gentlemen, Rotarians think globally and act locally. Thank you very much. What a fantastic contribution. It is really awesome, the real depth of the contributions we've had from all our speakers this evening. And Mohammed, I just know that um, there's some people in this room who are itching for concepts of how we can deepen our collaboration. And it's not a question, but I'm just throwing out to us in this project because we're thinking of what can we do to continue this alliance that this new alliance and when you've said that saturday the 5th of june we will be celebrating world environmental day in a big way a light bulb went up in my head and i think as chair of the d71 uk alliance project i can see us coming together on that day and really recognizing first our alliance in a significant way and celebrating um, World Environment Day where we, we as Toastmasters can do something around the environment in collaboration with Rotary. So I think you've given me something to go with and think about. And I know Elizabeth will like that idea as well. And we have a few of us other Toastmasters in the room who can take on that concept of doing something very significant on a district to district level, you know, on between both organizations. So we have Jean here, we have Mary, we have it off and we have our, our um, let me see, TJ's in the room as well and Andy. So we have a lot of significant players in the room who we can maybe take that concept forward and think about how can we do something very significant under the whole alliance idea yeah, on the um, Saturday, the 5th of June, to support the concept of World Environment Day coming from your presentation. It was really, really interesting. I know we have other persons in the room who may want to. I have other questions, but I'm going to open up the floor now to other people to contribute as well. I don't know if. Um, Patel, if you want to add anything at this point, or you have a question or make a contribution yourself, and then I could possibly invite Andy to do the same. No, I haven't got anything specific to add, but I'm really very, very pleased that we, we have been engaged in this, in this evening in, in, in the environment, which is going to be the seventh area of focus. And uh, like Mohammed says, uh, maybe on the 5th of June together, we can put together a program of, of something constructive uh, throughout Rotary and District uh, 1. Yeah. Yeah. And with Toastmasters, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Before you come in, Andy, I just want to ask, because one of the questions I, I had was, what can we do to inspire other clubs around the world to take action because that was something coming out of the video that we had from our past international president so we've had quite a few ideas come up but i i hear from various presentations different areas of concern but a real call about the importance of the green green fields nature the environment rising sea levels and the fact that the islands or other low-lying areas can can disappear what that's for any of the panelists what can we really do to inspire clubs to take more concrete action to addressing some of the very pertinent issues because i mean i am quite surprised at our numbers this evening because you think environment would be this is one of our smallest numbers we've had, and yet I think one of the most informative discussions we've had. I, I by far, I, I enjoyed last one very much, but this is so deep, so rich, and so informative. So I think, it, although the information we all are aware of the importance of the environment, I still think we need to do something to inspire people towards taking it seriously and taking action. So my question 
is for any of the panelists who can advise us on ways in which we can really inspire others to action. Yeah, perhaps I could just start by commenting, um, and I agree absolutely, we need to be inspiring action. What we've tried to do in, in the Rotary world is to um, share good news stories, you know, where we've had projects with bees or butterflies or, you know, successfully, you know, um, observing at the, um, the COP24 talks, you know, those sorts of issues are good news stories. So a lot of it's down to communications, so it's newsletters, Facebook pages, et cetera, you know, that we can share those good news stories. I think often, you know, Rotary doesn't sort of blow its own trumpet. It doesn't share all the good works and it does. Um, so a lot of it is getting the message out there. Things like the competitions are designed to inspire and promote action as well, because they will encourage like the Rodney Huggins Award is for clubs and the Young Environmentalist is for young people. So, you know, there are different competitions available for different people. Um, so, yeah, we still need to do more, though, to, to get the message out and inspire people to take action, big or small. Um, you know, I was talking to a club last week and um, they bought some um, bird boxes um, and they sponsored uh, a beehive. It doesn't have to be a major thing, but if every Rotary Club and every Rotarian did a little thing, then that would all add up. Yeah, yeah. I like that point. It doesn't have to be a big thing because the small things sometimes reach the members in the local area, can create local impact. And, and that's maybe how we need to think about the projects that we're doing. You know, think of doing something locally, you impact locally. And if every area does that, we will have big impact when we put it together. Okay. I have, I have a, another question that I would like to ask. And that one goes out to Stephen, because I think you allude to the fact that during the COVID period, there was an increased awareness because I guess we were locked down. And when we were let out, because I felt the same thing the first time I went to, in fact, I discovered Warden Park and there's another one close to me which is a walking distance that I've never been for three years. And I went to them for the first time when we were allowed out. So I'm, my question is, how responsive do you think the public is to the awareness of the connection between our well-being and nature? In your work, do you think, it's, it's a similar question like the inspiration question. How responsive do you think people are to that? that awareness of the importance. Because people do diets and they may go to milkshakes and so on, mm. but I'm not sure that people really appreciate enough. So it's a thank question to you. Yeah, thank you, Violet. Um, I agree. I think um, there's always been a certain number of people who actually are fully engaged with you know, the, the, the meaning of um, countryside and the environment. Um, and they understand it, and they engage with it fully. Then there's there's always been a number of people who who don't particularly engage with it um, for whatever reasons, um, and they may be young people or old people or, or older people. It, it's it's kind of getting the message across to them, I think, which, which is a some people. I mean, recently we had a program on, TV, on television here, David Attenborough, of course, who we all know and love. And he gave a program on extinction and how this is really is the final, almost the final grasp now. You know, we need to really do something now about this. And lots of people I know um, didn't want to watch it because they found it um, either, they, didn't want, they weren't interested, which is quite sad really, or they, they felt that um, it wasn't relevant to them. Which, which is, you know, it's actually relevant to all of us, no matter where we are, what we do, you know, what our feelings are, it is totally relevant. And part of my job with, in local government is to get that message across to people. And it, it can be quite challenging, but um, something Jean was saying previously um, about the small things, and because I work as a, as a wildlife artist and a writer too, about the environment, I take people out on, say, for instance, 
nature walks or sketching walks. So we get some families together and they come out one of our sites and they bring some sketchbook and some pens and pencils. And I sit them down and they, and they just sketch what they see around them. Now that might be, you know, seeds, it might be flowers, insects, butterflies, trees, or it could be something as big as a landscape. But while they're doing that, they're fully engaged with that landscape or that butterfly or that seed. Um, and I've had many cases where people have gone away and their parents have said to me at a later date, you know, my daughter, my son, they, they really de developed a love of, of drawing through looking at the natural world in a, in a very small way. And I think, you know, it's small things like that that can plant the seed and make people maybe, it may not always flower straight away, that seed, but it's there. And once it's there, you know, that, that they, as they get older and mature, they may come back to it and then think, oh yes, this is actually really important, this. And I, I love doing those drawings on that particular day at that countryside site, you know, maybe I need to encourage my children to do it, you know, and, and things, things can, you can engage people with these very small things. And I think art and writing and poetry and drawing is a really good way to do it. It's a really good way to get, children are very unreceptive to art, you know, and it, and it gets people away from, from mobile phones and laptops and everything else, gets them out into the real world, into nature, you know, where they can see things, smell things, um, feel things, you know, the sort of things that, that we did when we were children. And it, it's, it's bringing them back almost to, um, you know, to, to that sort of pre-state whereby we really engage with nature fully. And by engaging with it, then we, we understand it more. And whether that's drawing, you know, with, a, with, a, some, with a pencil on a piece of paper in a sketchbook or writing your thoughts or your feelings or doing some poetry, it's a really great way to inspire people. Yeah, yeah. And my, my last question, I think I'll, I'll give it to Dr. Henry. Just wondering similarly in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on the data that we collect through all things metallurgy. Have we seen any similar negative impact that interferes with the work of marine studies and marine life? during the pandemic period. You're muted. <laughs> You're muted. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, there is one, um, probably one element that I can, uh, I think has been dramatic and has had a huge impact. Um, and that relates to the people that nobody see every day and they are the seafarers that actually make world trade happen. 80% okay. of the world trade is carried by sea. And the people who are responsible for that are the seafarers of the world, but you will never see them. Uh, and they have been severely, that is the, I think the biggest outside of course of what's happening on land and we saw how the old people were impacted by COVID-19. But the people who were really severely impacted by COVID-19 with the closure of borders and the fact that the seafarers, many of them had been at sea for already 12 months and had to have extended their, they could not get off ship because nobody would allow them out because oh of course God. a COVID ship, a ship that comes in was deemed anybody was in, they could get the goods out, but they couldn't get the seafarers out. And the seafarers, more than, more than 400,000 seafarers a day are at sea, making world trade happen. And the, these are the people who therefore could not get off that ship and where you have suicide, of course, because of the issues and the pressures there, um, you know, they have, gone beyond their tour of duty. Um, they've not been able to, you know, even get off the ship, even on, into the port. This is probably one of the most dramatic things that I would say that humanity has failed to recognize how much we are dependent on shipping because 80% of world trade by, and every day, more than 400,000 ships are out there 
Of course, they, we saw the impact of the cruise industry as well. Um, and we even see, we already know many of them will go bankrupt or sell or, or get uh, um, absorbed by others. But the, the dramatic impact on human beings and people who, you know, they are all coming from the developing world. Most of the seafarers at sea come from the developing world. And they were the ones that have borne the brunt of, um, of, of the impact of COVID-19 while at the same time uh, and being responsible for making sure world trade happens and that we get the necessary you know, equipment, including medical, uh, medical equipment that are needed uh, in light of COVID. So this is probably the thing that I would, uh, I would say that we, we failed. We, the world has failed the seafarers. Um, and we, it will be a very difficult thing to attract young people to go to sea if this is something like that, something like that can happen to them, suicide mm -hmm. and all kinds of things like that because of the fact that they've been, uh, you know, they've not been able to get off the ship and uh, to transit and transfer because they have to transit and transfer through airports <clears throat> in, in order to be able to, to return home or to enable those who have to come on board to mm -hmm. be able to get to to the country, the places where they have to join the ship, so that those who have already been long time at sea can return home. Yeah. This is one of those things that I that I I, I I feel very strongly about. I've written a lot about. I have spoken a lot on that on that issue, and this is something that I think from the COVID nineteen pandemic, which impacts, of course, the entire world, uh, but of course we depend on shipping to have to get the goods. Uh, that we need to make uh, to, to to enable us to have the fruits that we eat every day and everything like that, the cars that we drive, all of these things we we take for granted. And these are the on the forgotten, unseen, unknown people who make it happen. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. There's so much work for us to do as leaders, you know, various professional fields and you know community work. And the discussions tonight really, really have brought that to the fore. And I'm going to ask Andy to make a contribution because I'm sure that he will not fail Luton Grocery Club of Summary. So Andy, can you say something on behalf of Luton Summaries on the topic of the environment and our discussions tonight before I ask um, Alistair to do the same on behalf of international orators. Thank you very much. Just a couple of things before uh, thank yous. It's been really inspiring to listen to, to the larger picture today. I think that's what's come across, the, the worldwide picture that, that we're facing and the, and the stories we've had. Um, but for me, it's, it's taking those bigger pictures and making that real for the community on the ground. And it made me think, um, and, I, and actually, um, I was just, um, Jean and I must, we were at the same meeting um, the other, uh, this last week, and we talked about beehives. We talked, they also talked about at that meeting, another an organization that were doing shoe aid, where they were actually recycling shoes, because oh. it was interesting if in Nottingham, they, they did locally and in Africa, they sent these shoes. But it's a hundred. It takes a hundred years um, for decaying in landfill shoes. Now we've got to think about how many things we leave there, and actually recycling. Um, as um, I, as you know, I work with lots of young people, and we're doing a project. And I think this is where I've kind of just made me think this evening. There's a project coming up called Chalkscapes, and it's about the environment in the Chilton area of, of this area, it's very, very chalky hillsides. And then we're engaging young people with funding from children in need. And the idea is that they look after the environment of that area. Now, you think, yeah, we'll go along and have a walk. Well, that's great. But actually being imaginative, being creative with those ideas, like we're looking at highways and byways, that brings your history into it. So young people, they're into history, Oh, wait a minute, there's an it, 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 it here. Ah, oh, using signposts and imaginative, creative ways of, of signage and way signage. 
it, it is interesting. So it's using those imaginative, creative skills that people have to then get the environment. And, I, and as many of you know, I'm really into the, my theatre and everything. And I'm thinking, well, actually, we should do more outdoor theatre because actually you've got, if you know, you do Shakespeare in, in the woods, you've actually got your scenery. You know, those kind of things bringing people into, and that's why I think we were talking, bringing people into the communities, bringing, using that environment has been what's really kind of triggered some ideas for me today. But as a, as a Rotary Club, and, and our club is, we, we, we're very much into our environment. We, we do quite a lot on locally with um, doing crisp, again, crisp packets, plastic, things like this, recycling. We're doing a project at the moment where we're making Christmas trees out of recycled bottles, um, which is to see. Um, so we're really into our recycling and reusing in, in um, Summeridge Rotary Club and um, the young people very much. And even on Monday, um, we are going to the parks and the young our Rotarians and our Rotaract and Interactors will be out there litter picking in the community, but are getting out there. So it is really about taking the bigger picture for me, then talking it right down to the local level local people see what they can do their small what their small little bit contributes to the bigger picture yeah um, certainly, certainly. As, 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 as I, I think that's the, the recipe really doing stuff on the ground and that being magnified as more and more people get involved yes. i think the, nicole has a burning question before we end so nicole if you can come on screen and ask your question Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going back a little bit. I had a question uh, earlier during the discussion, so I hope I'm not really bringing the, the meeting a little bit backwards. Um, but I did have a question for Dr. Uh, Dumbia Henry. Um, and it was something, uh, two statements that you made or two phrases from uh, your speech that really uh, resonated with me. And I just wanted to ask you a little bit if you could give some more information on that. So a few weeks ago, I gave a speech on the tangible and the intangible pandemic. And it was fueled by the fact that I saw lots of images um, on the television about the masks and the gloves and the sanitizer bottles that we're wearing at the bottom of the ocean. And I ended my speech by saying that we have to find a solution and since this is your area, I would like to know if you can give me any pointers that I can use myself and that I can transmit to my audience when I give a, a speech about the environment, about how we can avoid using the tools that are supposed to protect us as a tool that will work against us. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, um... Uh, certainly the, I mean, uh, I think what I would say is that the, 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 the marine litter, you know, take that's the broader context with plastics is just one form of marine litter, but marine litter is probably one of the most pugnacious of challenges that the world is facing. And, but, but all of us can do something about it, but at the same time, <laughs> How do you get all, all of us to do that? I think this is the big challenge. Um, uh, uh, but I think we owe it, um, well, that's why I'm thinking, my, my thought is that we've got to take to the schools, we've got to take, it, it has to be part of the educational system, unless we integrate these critical issues, greenhouse gas emission, I mean, simplify it, of course, to take it to, to the, but, but we have to start from the kindergarten, the primary schools, uh, all the way up to, well, university and beyond, and then, you know, hopefully. But I think education is the key to unlocking or to addressing these issues, but bringing these important subjects today that is so important for the environment and the world and for the future of mankind 
that if we fail to address this um, appropriately, and of course there's so many things going on and so many directions in which we can all go, but I, I, would, I would say, you know, when just at the end of the day, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals were so designed where they've identified all the major priorities and one of those, of course, is sustainable oceans. The ocean is the lifeblood of my humanity, right? And whatever we do to the oceans, we do to humanity in the short term, medium term, the long term. And thinking about the long term impacts of all the things that, you know, whether it's marine debris, which is everything that we throw into the sea, you know, whether it's, you know, fish gear, whether it is um, plastics. This, these are areas where I believe that every one of us can do something about in our neighborhood, in our, in our communities. And if we could just even use that important platform and get others to take it on board. I mean, it's a critical thing for me in, uh, at my university that I run. I'm saying I, I make, make sure that, although this is the World Maritime University, I and show that every year we do a cleanup with, we have a cleanup uh, in the city in which we live and we join forces with the local communities and we do a global cleanup of, uh, of, of, of the entire area that that city is in. Um, and, and, and then you, you see how people are coming together and you can see how they are managing this. But we can do that too. It takes it takes all of us coming together. It doesn't. We doesn't require payment. It doesn't require. It just requires identifying the days or the times of the year when we can all go down on a Sunday and do that ocean cleanup, do that beach cleanup, do that. You know. So I do think, and that is part of what we can do in encouraging young people. Young people with tomorrow will hold us accountable for the world they have to inherit. And it is because we have already done so much harm and we're not doing enough now to take it forward. So I would only say that it's a big sub subject here, but that's a big subject, but um, we can do something about plastics. We can do something about marine litter and we should. Thank you very much. And with that, I will call on Alistair to wind up this evening, this really, really fantastic evening depth of discussion, very esteemed and distinguished persons in our mix, really bringing all pertinent issues on the environment to the fore on this series, show four. Alistair, over to you. Um, thank you, distinguished Toastmaster Violet. Um, <clears throat> I hope I'm able to do that in the two minutes that I've been given. Well, you have exactly <laughs> had two minutes to end the show. <laughs> so um, let me start by thanking the people that have, that have contributed. Because obviously, for this to be a success, it needed the participation of all the people that are here. That would be these distinguished panelists, Rotarians, Toastmasters, guests, our host Toastmaster, um, Elizabeth, and um, the host, sorry, <laughs> the Toastmaster for the, for the evening, Elizabeth, and the host, um, Violet. So it's my pleasure on behalf of the International Orators Toastmasters Club to, to thank you all for participating in today's excellent program. I think it was well put together. It was, the tone was set by the videos at the beginning, it got people thinking and in the frame of mind to discuss the environment. Um, the, the remarks um, by Dr. Gumbia Henry were, were very challenging and very informative and well delivered. And um, the focus on marine, the marine environment, marine litter being one of the key things that she brought up and then the best practices. I think that was a valuable contribution to what we have here today. Um, Mr. Steve um, Halton, if I've got the name correct, he brought the link in to the environment and the need for both individual and community involvement in the fight against both COVID-19 and environment climate change. Um, he was also very informative. I had uh, Nathan, he brought attention 
a very um, an area I think most people are not aware of, um, highlighting the importance of our air aviation routes in contributing the much needed data for our weather forecasts and the importance of maintaining some form of data collection for the future going forward. And I think it was an area I'm, I'm, I was un unaware of and um, it was education for myself. So I must thank you for really highlighting that and putting it across in such a, an effective manner. Um, Rotarian, we, we had Jean Billingham also making a contribution, um, giving an overview of Rotary and the environment and the projects and the fact that they're focusing both locally and at the district level where clubs are coming together. And um, the fact that the Rotary clubs are trying to set an example by taking action and not waiting for any sort of other forum to push them forward and that they have the support from the top of the organization providing the tools and the resources that they need so they can then take it out into the wider environment. And um, the competition that like Dr. Mohammed mentioned um, on climate change, that was some useful information that we could probably, in this forum, we can try to spread that information out to get wider participation in that project. And um, I think the overall, the, this, the healthy discussion that was generated, I'm only sorry we didn't have enough time to explore the avenues, but the questions that were posed were all challenging and all handled well by the panelists in their answer. So I'd like to close by thanking everyone for their participation and hoping that this information is recorded and if you can get it to more people. So it's not a fact that even though we don't have a large attendance tonight, but we can have some emphasis and see if we can get people to look at it, you know, post the event. Um, the information is there and is there to be shared and, you know, the, the value is in sharing it as much as we can. So again, thank you very much for all the participation of all the speakers and all the guests. I hope you found it useful and welcome and you'll come back to our next event. I'll now hand back over to our Toastmaster. Thank you very much. And that brings to an end our evening. And we normally hang out for a few minutes if people just want to go informal once we stop live streaming. So I will stop our live streaming.